just going over some of the other aspects of the architecture. So we've got what we call a, a data manager. Um, that's a supervisory system, so uh, front-end. Um, that allows us to look into the system, um, all our graphing and log retention, um, setting up certain features. So that's, that's a good viewing platform. Um, the system will run without it. So it's not dedicated on that front front end to be um, there to, to work. Um, the controllers are all standalone. Welcome to another CO2 Monday and the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and today I have a special guest, James Derby from Resource Manage RDM, Resource Data Management. Data Management. I, I, it's new to me, uh, James, so it's, <laughs> I'm going to get it uh, from New Zealand. I'm super excited about this conversation because I've been hearing about RDM for quite a few years now, and I've only actually seen one site with RDM on it here in Canada. I'm sure there are some. And why I want to have this conversation is because, first of all, I want to learn more about it. I have lots of people that reach out to me and say, Trevor, you should get someone from RDM on uh, the podcast. And James was willing to come on. So James, welcome to the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks for um, having me on the show. <clears throat> oh, you're uh, very welcome. Here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you. Um, I, I, you know, I always do some research on the guests and stuff, and I see that you've been in the industry over 20 years. You started out as a technician, engineer, just like me, and worked your way up to the position you have today as a manager of the New Zealand branch of RDM. Why don't you tell me, tell us a little bit about uh, your path getting to this position? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I started as a refrigeration apprentice back in 1998, I think it was, um, and learnt my, my trade there. Um, and controls have always been sort of a part of, um, you know, the industry. Um, so, and they sort of captured my attention. Um, I did do a brief stint in um, the UK um, and uh, got enticed to come back to be involved in um, first subcritical CO2 plant in New Zealand, um, the installation. So um, I didn't want to miss out on that fun. Um, and so I came back to New Zealand um, and sort of just moved through um, through the business and sort of service manager, project manager, um, commissioning engineer. Um, but the controls have always really been a, um, a focus for me. Um, we've worked on a lot of brands um, in New Zealand, um, but RDM was one that really sold it for me. Um, and from there, we've uh, grown RDM and using it in a lot of different scenarios. Um, and so, yeah, thought we would start RDM New Zealand. And I'm now I'm manager of that um, and still enjoying the control. So That's there awesome. we are. That is super awesome. So all the way back in the mid to late 2000s, you, you started working on CO2. Is that really when you started getting involved in into CO2 projects and started learning more about CO2? Um, yeah, the, the first one was in 2007, I think. Um, and then it wasn't until, I think, 2010 or 11, we did the um, our first supermarket um, subcritical system, um, pump, pump CO2, um, medium temp, and DX low temp. Um, and then they've just been progressing since then. So quite a few of those, and then on onto transcritical refrigeration, um, CO2, sorry. Um, yeah, and it just keeps evolving. Yeah, so I know um, I've talked to many people in New Zealand. You guys have quite a few CO2 transcritical stores, and, and they continue to grow, and same globally. They, they continue to yep. grow. Um, so I'm assuming you've been involved in that, one of the first transcritical stores or some of the trans CO2 transcritical scores there. Um, do they use RDM and how many projects right now or how many stores do you have with RDM using uh, CO2 transcritical systems? Um, in New Zealand, we must have around about 30, 35 stores awesome. with RDM in it um, on transcritical CO2. And then obviously there's some subcritical CO2. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's growing. That, that is very impressive. And like I, I said to you earlier, like I'm new to RDM and uh, mm -hmm. understanding, why don't we talk a little bit the advantages of RDM and its platform itself? I know you said you have a few slides that you can show. Why don't we uh, introduce to the group uh, 
really what RDM is all about, and uh, and then I can get into some good questions on uh, CO2 systems. Um, yeah, so um, RDM or Resource Data Management um, was it's was founded in uh, 2000, um, and um, the route they wanted to go on was on an IP um, backbone, communication backbone. Um, and there's several advantages with um, an IP network. Um, so we've got our reliability, um, we've got our communication speed, um, you know, the um, ease of connection. So anywhere on the network, we can plug a laptop in um, and basically open a web browser and we've got full view of our system. Um, another benefit is that um, we can do software updates on controllers. So we can log into the remotely into the system. Um, we can, if we've got a controller that needs to a software update or you wanted some new features, um, that can be done over the network. Um, so there's no description files or um, anything that needs to be loaded into the, what we call front end or the supervisory system. Um, we can just go straight into the controller update um, and you've got your new version of software, um, you know, and fault finding as well. Um, you know, you go to a local um, electrical supplier and buy a network cable tester. So with that, you know, it becomes a lot simple, a lot simpler in ascertaining whether there's um, a fault on the network um, and the communication speeds as well uh, are greatly in compared to um, Modbus or um, some of the long works. Yeah, I see a lot of um, I see a lot of controller that use Modbus today. Is that can then I see even in yours when I looked up into your uh, website, you guys can have the option of Modbus as a slave, I believe. Um, but I've seen a lot more controllers and control manufacturers go into Modbus. And what is if the IP is more uh, robust why, why are they going to the mod bus because i don't really know myself personally um i mean there's two types of mod bus networks there's um uh, mod bus tcp ip which is mod bus over an ip network mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. um and then you've got mod bus rtu which is a usually a two-wire communication chain so the advantage um with an ip network over say mod bus is that mod bus is usually um, especially in the RTU or the two wire um, is um, what they call daisy chain. So the communication network yeah. is a daisy chain between them all. Um, with IP, you can go um, like in a star topology. So it doesn't have to be in a daisy chain. It can branch off and go to any controller you'd like. Um, but there's still a lot of people, I suppose Modbus, um, if you're talking like a chiller plant or a, a rack um, and it has Modbus on the controller, um, it can be integrated into a third party system a lot easier. Um, you know, there's things like people are moving to BackNet as well now, so which is more of a, a plug and play, self describing um, communication. So you don't have to do all the template that you would or the Modbus registers that you would with the Modbus controller. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that. I've actually seen. Uh, different manufacturers putting a um, backnet on their controllers that they never had before. So mm. I think, I think that's going to come in, come into play. Um, so when we talk about RDM and their CO2 solutions, I'm assuming that you would have many controllers and different controllers. Cause I, I went in and I took a look and you have the intuitive controllers, but you'd have, I guess a CO2 pack controller would be your main CO2 controller. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yep. So we have controllers obviously on the plant side, the pack side, um, and um, fixtures as well. So cabinets and cool rooms. Um, so with our intuitive, intuitive range, um, that's where we, we've got a um, CO2, it's called a super pack controller. Um, <clears throat> shall I s share the slide so people get an understanding of what? Sure. It's a they good look idea. Like? Um, so can you see my screen, Trim? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Um, so this is a architectural layout of a typical um, system. Um, I'll just change it to a pointer. Um, 
laser pointer. Um, so when you mentioned the intuitive controllers, this is um, what we're talking about here, rack controller. Um, so that has, um, and that can come in different variants. So whether it's a um, super pack transcritical controller, um, and we do other ranges too, so like a standard super pack controller, so it'd be for more synthetic refrigerants, which we're not um, here to discuss. Um, but it's a flexible controller, so it doesn't matter whether you've got a small CO2 um, transcritical plant with a couple of compressors um, on the low temp and a couple on the medium temp, right through to a larger rack where you may have, um, you know, half a dozen medium temp compressors, parallel compressors. Um, and low temp compressors, um, you can just expand it by putting on expansion boards onto it. So whether that's extra stepper valves or um, relay boards to be able to control more compressors, um, oil management. So they're quite flexible. Um, and a good thing with them too is that you can assign all your relays to it. So when you're actually doing all the wiring, you can go, okay, well, I want this relay to do this compressor and and vice versa, you know, so you, it's quite flexible in the sense that you can program it to where all your wiring is. So if you were doing a retrofit on a site, um, you'd be able to make it a lot easier installation process. Yeah. And then that makes it, because if you can change the different um, points on there, it, it makes it a lot easier because I see a lot of controllers say, okay, this these ones are only for, you know, compressor or heaters, or this one's only for a certain point and you, it makes it a bit more yep. flexible and adding expansion packs that's that makes it a lot simpler too so you can you can buy what you yes. need i guess uh yeah and you can have up to i mean the, you can have up to 10 expansion boards on it so there is a oh. you know i think it'll be a pretty pretty big plant for that but yeah um but the the options there um so um just going over some of the other aspects of our architecture. So we've got what we call a, a data manager. Um, that's a supervisory system, so a front end. Um, that allows us to look into the system, um, all our graphing and log retention, um, setting up certain features. So that's, that's a good viewing platform. Um, the system will run without it. So it's not dedicated on that front, front end to be, um, there to to work. Um, the controllers are all standalone. Um, so it gives you some really good options there. And again, for um, viewing and um, graphical displays, um, fault finding, you know, it's got a 15 second logging interval. So you can have your whole supermarket or um, site um, logging at 15 second interval. Um, and that will retain years and years of data. It's got a 16 gigabyte um, solid state drive awesome. on it. So yeah. that's yeah, awesome. It retains a lot of data. That's so important because that's, for me, I what I liked about here in Canada, we mostly have E2 or CVC and microthermal. And one of the big difference why I like microthermal a lot, I could go back two years. I could see what it was last summer around the same time and what how the system was reacting. And that's what I like you said about this, I could go back and I can data log a bunch of different points and you know, mm. that's the way to troubleshoot. And now with CO2 systems, yes. there's so many points that are taken and you can really get to the fine, fine tuning of troubleshooting when you have all these different yep. points and you're not just guessing. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yep. That's um, a key. Cause as you say, there's so much going on now in a um, refrigeration system um, that you know, you need to have that visibility to understand what's been happening. You know, is it, um, you know, is it a faulty probe or um, is there something happening at night, you know, and, and you're trying to establish what it is. So with that 15 second interval, it gives you a really clear picture. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> um, so with the rack controllers as well, the intuitive, um, which I just wanted to touch on is that um, a lot of people are doing more bespoke projects now, you know, they're coming up with a different design and, and uh, equipment or plant um, and they want flexibility. Um, buying a off the shelf, you know, pre-programmed controller, sometimes that, that doesn't quite sit in the right area. 
Um, so there's another link or another side to our intuitive and that's called the TDB, which is our PLC. So TDB stands for the data builder. Um, so that's a PLC system. So we've, we've uh, got a few um, clients that are, have been moving down that path um, to be able to have their own flexibility and design a system to how they want it to control. Is it, you know, not every system's the same and they're doing, trying to do different things. So um, that's come into big play now, um, having that flexibility. Um, you know, you get all the same functionality. Um, you, know, you can have stepper motor expansion boards or um, controlling different valves, um, but it gives you that freedom to be able to go, right, this is how we want to control it. This is, you know, we're doing something different here. Um, so there is, there's a large amount of flexibility in it. And so with that, that would be really that, say that manufacturer, that contractor can really build um, what they want to do. So they'll say, okay, when this temperature hits this, this fan turns on for an example, or make this valve open up to a hundred percent or vice versa. Yes. And yeah. What kind of uh, programming do you use? I know I'm jumping ahead here. Are you using like no, uh, function blocks or what, what are you using? Yeah, so the, the function box is uh, like a pictorial um, block um, and you drop and drag a line. Um, we've got multiple different um, blocks in there, built in there. So you've got all your mathematical, your, um, you know, your um, not or and block, um, valve blocks. So um, to control stepper outputs, um, you know, refrigerant to um, or pressure to temperature blocks. Um, so you can really build your own full package. Um, so whether you're controlling, you know, whether you're wanting to control ejectors or um, parallel compressors, um, you know, right through to, um, you know, ammonia or hydrocarbons. So it's, um, it's a flexible system. That's awesome. So in inside the, the those controllers, like as I know a lot of a lot of manufacturers are using either like the the Danfoss high pressure valve or the Corels or the the spore lens. Um, would these controllers network with those so it can read and write back and forth, or do you build your own program for those high pressure valves? Uh, no, so the high pressure valves um, generally um, most of them are a stepper valve. Um, so that's that's not a problem. We control all types of stepper valves. Um, so whether it's Corel, Danfoss, Spallen, Alco, um, we've got no problems connecting to those. Um, obviously, you select it in your in your system, the valve, the amount of steps, you know, your, your holding current. So all those parameters you can put in. Um, or whether it be a zero to ten valve, I think the old uh, the Danfoss, um, so the ICMTS valves i think they were like a zero to ten volts um so we've got that option too so you can switch between you know stepper um on the high pressure gas valve stepper or a zero to ten volt four to twenty milliamp yeah yeah that, and that's cool so so with that you could do it either way then first of all like they yes. build an algorithm i guess and that's why you want they want to use their controller but uh, you could potentially build your own algorithm for different stepper valves you're saying with this, uh, with your platform. Yep. So even on the, um, like a standard super pack controller, transcritical super pack controller, um, you know, that algorithm's already built in, but you can connect any type of valve. And there's a drop down box to go, okay, it's a small end valve. Um, you know, it's got this many steps. Um, or when you're doing it, like on your PLC side of things, you've got a stepper block. So it's a stepper output block, and then you just go in there and select it the same way. So you don't, um, I mean, you're only, I suppose your algorithm that you sort of build is around your um, PID loop mm. on how yeah. it controls. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, so that's cool. That's real cool. So it's it sounds very user-friendly if you can just pick the manufacturer of the valve itself. So that's all built in. So if I wanted to use Sporlin, you could pick Sporlin, is that right? Yes, yep, that's right. Oh, super cool. What about for the case? And I see you got case and cold room controllers because this is a big thing. You're seeing this with CO2. Mm -hmm. You didn't see it as much with uh, HFCs, but now with CO2, with electronic valves, you need pressure uh, transducers, temperature probes. Uh, do you integrate these in with cases for case manufacturers? And uh... um, yes, so a lot of manufacturers will install um, 
pretty much any controller you want into them. Um, so it comes down to the client purchasing at the end of the day, what brand they want, but yes, we do. Um, so um, yes, we got case controllers um, and they come in two different variants. They come in a, in a panel mount um, or a DIN, rail, a DIN rail mount version. Um, and then we've got the cold room panels. Um, so with the case controllers, um, we have the ability to have a transducer wire directly into it, um, multiple probes. So we have five um, temperature probes plus a logging probe. Um, so you can attach a logging probe to it. So whether you've got a product simulator probe or um, you've uh, um, some other sort of logging probe that you want to log the temperature, um, we've got that ability. We can do um, pulse valves, so um, EEV pulse valves or stepper valves. Um, so depending on, you know, if you want to use stepper motors, we've got that um, ability. Um, with the transducers, one good benefit we have is that we can broadcast the pressure. So I'm um, just going back to the um, architecture layout. So here we've got what's called a um, mercury hub. So that hub, um, we can wire a transducer into that. So if you've got um, a lineup of say medium temp or low temp controllers, connected to that hub, then we can wire a transducer into it. And then that transducer will share that pressure with all the cap, uh, case controllers. So you've just removed the need to have a transducer wired into every controller. Um, or these, there's another option, which is we can actually, because it's an IP network, we can send the pressure from the rack controller. And we can broad that, broadcast that across a network so then the case controllers can pick that up. So then you don't have any transducers out in the field. It's got the one on the on the rack or the, the pack. Well, um, what would be some of the limitations to that though? So because everyone has their own idea. Like some people are like, well, I don't I got five cases, they're all piped together, and I want to have five transducers in case one fails. And other people are like, well, no, I just want one. It'll control all five. But now that you said that you get the network one, that you can use the network one, I'm kind of thinking, well, if that one failed in the case, you could use the network pressure just to get you through. What could be the limitation if you went with just that network one and not one in the cases? Have you seen anything like that? Um, no, so you've got the ability to put all your pressure drop into the case controller, so you can account for that. Um, and then the other um, safety feature we have is that if that transducer pressure is lost across the network, um, the controller will revert back to an inlet, the evaporator inlet and outlet probe or suction probe to calculate the superheat. So I'll generate an alarm and go, okay, we've lost the transmission of that broadcast pressure. So we're gonna switch to um, controlling on inlet and outlet probe. It's not as um, <laughs> accurate, but it still allows the cabinet to keep, or the fixer to keep running. Yeah. So it generates an alarm. That's perfect because uh, what you're worried about is you're flooding back and you lose something, but or it's just shutting all together and you're losing product. You're losing a compressor or losing product, both are bad. But now at least you can maintain maybe a little bit until you get a technician or engineer out there to to fix the problem. That's awesome. Yeah, and it, as I said, um, you know, that it, it saves on installation costs, um, and then we've also reduced the amount of potential leaks out in the field as well. So we're not having so many transducers because they're generally, you know, um, connected to some type of, of thread fitting. Yeah. And that's huge. You know, that's five. If it's a five case thing, that's five less welds, you know, for access fittings. Yes. Yeah. Especially if we're using hot gas, defrost and stuff. Do you guys use much of that in New Zealand? Hot gas defrost or more electrical? No, it's more electric defrost over here. Yeah. Um, so, and with the case controllers too, so we can do multiple things with them. So we can, um, as we were talking about, sending the, the pressure or broadcasting the pressure across the network. Um, we can do other things across the network as well. So whether it's, um, we want to do a set point um, change, um, we can rem uh, send a command across the network to change a set point, um, uh, super heat set point. So um, I believe one of your previous podcast um you were 
talking with um, about um, the FTE, mm. the EPTA FTE. Um, Great solution. You know, so we've yeah, so we've got the ability now to um, be able to send a command to that controller and go right, you know, change adjust the superheat by this. So, you know, if you're wanting to flood those evaporators, um, that's an ability now. Um, trim heater control. Um, so whether you're wanting, you've got a humidity or dew point sensor in the in the um, store, um, we can then use that to um, calculate how how long the trim heaters need to be on for. Um, so reduce them um, and have their um, operating percentage, you know, sort of automatically fluctuating um, and maintaining the right temperature. Um, even to going into case off mode or lights only mode, um, we can send those commands across the network. So, um, you know, that brings a f quite a few benefits from it. Yeah, that's huge. So if you can set this stuff up and it's all done automatically within the network, when you hit these certain points or yeah, or these parameters or these points, temperature, pressure, doesn't matter. All of a sudden that will engage a certain command to happen across the network. Which yeah, so uh, like an example might be um you know a, a drinks cabinet um in the store and um you know at closing time or at nine o'clock at night you might want it to go from four degrees to eight degrees try and save some energy um you can set that up to automatically happen yeah um and even inside the controller you can do it with the um, lights as well so uh, sorry you can you can align it with the lights so when the lights go off the Refrigeration stops um, you know, for sort of non-critical um, display cases. Yeah, and and that's awesome because this is more and more. I talk to more end users, more contracts, more manufacturers, and it's all about how do we save as much energy as possible, as well as you know not run the system so hard like they used to just run wide open the whole time. And now you can start getting these little savings, and over time it leads to big savings which is really neat. Yes. And if it's done automatically and nobody has to go do anything, that's the big thing, right? So. Yeah. Um, while we're on the uh, talking about cabinets, I'm just going to take you to another slide, which is sort of goes over um, some of the features of the, the case controllers. Um, so with our intuitive range, um, as mentioned, we sort of do an e, we do a, a pulse width valve, stepper valve, um, do a twin EV pulse. What's um, that mean? So if you've got a, uh, so it will control two, um, two coils, two evaporators. So one controller will control two evaporators. So it will look at the um, evaporator inlet, evaporator outlet, um, pressure transducer, um, supply air, return air, and defrost as well. Um, so you, if you've got a, a one room with two evaporators in it, um, you can use that to control the superheat on both evaporators. Okay, do they um, need to be piped together or can they be piped separately or piped together? It doesn't matter. Um, they could be piped separately as long as, okay. yeah, they're on the same same circuit or same system. Yeah. Um, uh, we do a... Um, a three EV pulse controller as well and stepper. So pulse and stepper. Um, a plate heat exchanger controller. Um, that's, and um, we do our own stepper motor filters as well and power store. So for the stepper controllers, obviously, you know, a big um, concern used to be well, what happens in a power cut. Um, you know, the stepper valve would normally stay where it its last position was. Um, so we've got um, power store, um, which is a capacitor bank. Um, so that supplies enough a power to the controller in the event of a power failure and allows that valve to be driven shut. So is that built into the controller or is that an add-on? Uh, for the uh, case controllers, that's an add-on. Um, when we look at the cold room panels, the stepper cold room panel comes with it built in. Okay. Yeah, awesome. That is great. Yeah. Um, the the mini step three would that be more for I guess um, twelve foot box like 
like cases and stuff like that where they have three evaporators or is that just for cold rooms as well like to control three um electronic valves where are you seeing that yeah more? It, it's um it is probably more for the cabinets but uh look if you had a preparation area like in your um like your butchery preparation or produce preparation area in the supermarket um or any other site you know it's it could work in that scenario as well. So whether you've got one big area with three evaporators, um, yeah, there's no reason it won't work there. Yeah, perfect. Mm. Um, so there was a couple of things I just wanted to touch on with the case controllers. Um, so we talked about the superheat control options. So whether it's local um, through a network hub or through the pack broadcasting that pressure, um, we've got uh, EV control types as well. So when you're setting up the controller, you can decide on what kind of algorithm you want the expansion valve to work around. Um, so we've got what's called EV, um, and and that is based around your superheat. So you put in a set point of 8K or 10K superheat, and that's what the valve's trying to maintain. Um, and then we have EET, which is more based around the temperature so the temperature of the cabinet or the the cool room um so it will still look at superheat um, but only if it starts to get too low and it's mainly looking around the temperature of the of the room um then we have ev slash eet so with that mode you're controlling based or the valve based on temperature and then as you um get to your set point Sorry, you're controlling on superheat. And then as you get to your set point, rather than the valve going, okay, say, uh, um, I'm going to have to use degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, um, so say if you had a freezer set point of minus 20, um, the valve would, uh, sorry, the, the controller would get to minus 20 and then the valve would shut. And then it would, you'd have a couple of degrees um, cut in differential and then the valve would open back up again. Um, with a EV slash EET, what we do is when we get close to that set point, we just throttle the valve back. So we're not cycling the valve on and off um, or the cabinet on and off. We're trying to get a smoother temperature line and also, you know, uh, pressure as well. So we're not having cases here and there turning on and off. Um, we're trying to trying to gain a smooth line, smooth um, pressure. And I think that would be very key in when you have like a system with, say, five, five sets of glass doors, 60 feet. And all of a sudden, you know, some of these valves start to close off. It'll drop the pressure in that main line, start cutting things off. Valves start closing because that's when you need to really fine tune a, a system. But with that set up there, that sounds kind of key where it won't shut that valve off, like you said, and, and try to maintain some, uh, like a tighter, that tighter temperature set point and even tighter pressure. Cause it's all about that. How tight, how, you know, how, how straight can we keep that line? Mm. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And there's, there's some other um, options in there as well, which can help with that. Like, um, I'm not sure what it's like um, where you live, but um, a lot of cabinets or, especially cabinets here because they come most majority of them come in from overseas so they could come with a valve pre-fitted um sometimes those valves can be oversized yeah oh yeah you know and when you've got a, a like a pulse valve going on and off that is oversized you can get quite erratic control of your cabinet um pressures um you know flood back or overshooting of the valve um so we've got the ability in there and um I've seen quite a few people using it, so they'll look at the cabinet and go, "Okay, it's a, um, it's, a it's a five kilowatt cabinet. This valve can do ten kilowatts worth of duty, um, and you can actually put a, a valve divider in, so you can calculate and go, okay, well, to get that five kilowatts, um, I'm only going to allow my valve to open to sixty percent of its capacity. Um, so it won't." In its PID logic, it won't ever go above 60% opening. Mm. So you can actually try and fine tune the valve to the cabinet that way. I mean, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a pulse valve, so it's either open or closed, but mm. at least it doesn't allow the logic to get away on itself 
is they can react quite quick. Yeah, and, also, and that's if super you open important. It 100%... Sorry. Oh, that's what I was just saying, you know, that, but opens to 100%, they can, you know, um, you can do it quite quickly. So being able to limit it, actually tune it to the system, um, it does help. Yeah, no, and that's very important. I've seen that many times. All of a sudden, the valve open up 100% and all of a sudden it slams shut and you're just hunting because it's oversized. And in some cases, I know I've seen manufacturers had to oversize them for their design. So they're running at like, 15 percent for if they do reverse gas defrost things like that so it all depends on the yep. manufacturer but if you have key features in there that you can really fine tune it a bit more even though you have an oversized valve you always want to go with a valve that's matched <laughs> but if you have an oversized valve like this case you can set it up and fine tune it cool hmm. um <clears throat> i mean there's some uh So this is out of the cold room panel. Um, nice box, isolator on it, screen's removable. It's got all the same features as what um, the um, case controllers do. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the stepper version has an inbuilt power store in it. So you don't need any extra additional modules to connect to it. Um, it's all built in. Um, and they have pretty big relays on them as well. Um, but you can do all your door open sensor, light, uh, door open switches, you know, man trap, um, light control through it. Um, so it is a, it's a good, it's a good controller. Um, I just wanted to, um, so we can do fan pulse as well. So we've got fan features in there. Um, so with a, when you get to set point, um, you would like to turn your fans off and then every, um, X amount of minutes, bring them on for a set period of time to stir the air and then turn back off. Um, so all those little little features, just trying to, you know, gain a bit more um, savings through energy. Yeah, and, and that's key. It's these little little things that add up to a lot throughout a whole a big supermarket, right? Because you get dozens and dozens of hundreds of cases. And if you can save a little energy here and there throughout the day, the week, the month, the year, that's huge. Mm. Um, um, I don't know if you have come across any of our energy benefits or features um, while you've been looking. Um, I seen there on your website it talked about the energy benefits, but I didn't get time to dive into it. Okay. Um, so, like everyone, we do pack optimization or um, floating of the suction pressure. Um, and that can be assigned to whatever type of um, whatever cabinets you like. So um, you don't have to assign it to everything. You can assign it to maybe your coldest operating um, fixtures. Um, and that will automatically, so you can set your limit that you would like to float your suction pressure. So whether it's two bar, three bar, four bar, um, and it will look at those cabinets and go, right, okay. We are, we're easily achieving temperatures, so that's start floating the suction pressure up. Um, and it'll automatically step it back down when needed to. Um, but one I really like is um, called case performance or the TPI, temperature performance indicator. Um, so what that is, is that's a feature on there and you will set it to look at different parameters. So generally your set point, your differential, um, your high alarm temperature and your low alarm temperature and your valve state. So what it does is it looks at those parameters and it goes, right, okay, I'm achieving temperature um, and I'm doing that quite easily. Um, I'm not going above, you know, I'm not swinging too high above my cut in temperature and I'm not dropping too far below my cut out temperature. Um, and I haven't hit my alarm parameters. So, um, you know, I'm operating very well. So you get a, a good score. Um, where it really comes in and I think is uh, beneficial to service engineers and that is um, when you may be getting close to your temperature set point, you just can't, you know, your, your case is never getting there and it's never cycling the valve. 
um, it then goes, right, okay, well, we're close to our set point, but we're not cycling the valve. So um, something's going on there and it will keep decreasing the score. And so when you look at the system, you go, oh, okay, um, you know, I've got all these green ones, um, but there's a red one here, but it looks like it's, you know, if the set point was one degree and it's sitting at two degrees, um, but it can see that there's an issue there. So it starts flagging it, which, you know, is helpful for the end, end users, the, um, and especially the technicians as well, because they can see a problem before, you know, the cabinet actually ices up and then you've got high temperature issues or, you know, if there's a couple of fans out or, um, you know, so it's a good visual tool um, to be able to ascertain what's going on. Yeah, like that's great for pro, uh, proactive maintenance and service, right? Because like you said, if it starts to freeze up, and I see this many times, you get a call 10 hours after it's frozen up or something. But this could be a red flag before when the, the manager's ready, you know, and okay, I can make the phone call or send it out, or you get alarmed automatically, I'm, I'm assuming. I think that's pretty cool. Yes. Like the floating suction, I think most manufacturers have that. I don't know many. I, this yep. is one of the first time I've seen this case performance. So that's it's kind of a game changer because if you can, I could go into a store and say, okay, system 27, case three, is red all the rest of them are green well you know there's somewhere to check before i leave you know if that's not even my service yep. call right yeah yes yeah, it's, it's just an easy visual tool you know and um it's um we're seeing it where you know it's even the store manager can have a look and go oh that doesn't look right because all they need to know is is it green or red <laughs> is it green orange or red um you know, if it's red, then okay, we, we've got, we may need someone to come and have a look at that. So maybe when they when they're in tomorrow, or um, whether you place a call for it, um, you know, it allows them to to see it. Um, <clears throat> so we do uh, what's called night blind detection as well, which I think is another another good little um, system. So there we look at um, uh, air on and air off probe, um, set some parameters around it. Um, and the times that the store shuts or the lights go off. And then in there, it should see the temperature from your return air and uh, your return and supply drop closer together. Um, when it doesn't, the night blinds are obviously they're not down. So I can do a daily report. So you're coming in the morning and will be saying, right, okay, all these cabinets, night blinds weren't pulled on them. So again, around the, the maintenance and the um, energy efficiency of it, yeah, that, and that's pretty cool because usually it's just you're relying on the, your workers, you're there to, to shut them, you know, whatever department mm. you're in. And then now you can have an idea of who's doing their job and who's not doing their job or the end user. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So many benefits. Um, so many benefits. Yeah. Yep, there are. Um, We've got, um, so we've got a new COP feature as well. Um, so you can use this on your cabinets um, to get a bit of an understanding. Obviously it, it doesn't, um, not, not everyone will be familiar with it, um, but I think it's an, a nice feature. I'd like, I quite enjoy it. It's, um, it's quite cool to be able to have that on a system and see it, um, see your COP graph. Um, so do you have this on any CO2 stores, this new feature? Um, I think there that may be on a couple in New Zealand. Okay. Um, again, and it depends on the, on the client because so all our data, our data managers um, are front ends. They come out with all the features in them uh, and then you just enable what you, what you like. Um, so some people go for it, some people don't. Uh, and it just depends on the on the end user. Yeah. So the ones that we talked about already, these are add-ons. For example, like if you want to do the night curtain ones, you'll have to pay a monthly fee or yearly fee or whatever it is. Uh, it's, no, it's just an activation fee. So there's no, oh. we don't have any monthly fees or or anything like that. It's um, it's just an activation fee. So um, it saves you having to buy everything out, like everything 
yeah. outright. Yeah. Um, you can actually go, okay, well, I want, you know, I want this data manager and um, we're going to have 10 cases on it um, and a couple of plant controllers. Um, so I only need these features um, later down the track if you do a um, redevelopment of the store and, and you need to add more fixtures or you want to add something in like an uh, energy benefit or an energy feature, you just contact us, we give you a code, you plug it in and it's there. Yeah. So awesome. there's no, yeah, we don't have to do a software update or anything like that. Not unless there's new features out that you would, you would like. Um, and that's probably the, um, you know, that's a good thing with the RDM system is so, probably digressing a bit here and going back to sort of the, the communication side of things, but um, is that you can take a data manager. So if you had a new data manager on a, um, and you had to install it on a 20 year old site, you just go and plug it in. Um, you can upload your configuration file, but the, the system doesn't need description files. So it's not like you go, right, okay, well, the plant controller is 20 years old um, and um, I need to find that description file to add it into the into the data manager to make it communicate. It's all XML um, communication, which is an open protocol. So it just builds, its, it's got its own template. So you plug it in and it pops up and you've got all the information there and vice versa too. So if you had a 20 year old data manager, you could go and plug a brand new case controller in and it just auto builds its template on the front. Hmm. Interesting. How difficult is this to retrofit from another manufacturer's controller? So just say you got a 20 year old store like that and you have another manufactured controller. Is it more difficult to retrofit an RDM compared if you went with their controller? Do you have to rip everything out from that other manufacturer? Or is there things that you can utilize that may be already in there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is, and again, it depends site to site. Um, so in the, what we've experienced in the past is that um, the retrofitting of the controllers isn't, it's not a hard task and it just depends on it because some systems are centralized, you know, so everything's in the motor room, all your relay boards and everything. Others are more decentralized. Um, but like what RDM is, so you know you got your controllers at the cabinets and um, you know controllers on the plant and the plant room, so it's more spread out. But um, with the IP network, you know there's usually already some sort of IP infrastructure in the building, you know, so it's not hard to tap into that. Um, we can if you've only got four eight five network running around the building. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's, it's probably usable um, in some instances, um, but the cost of um, you know Cat five cable or Cat six cable nowadays is is not terribly expensive. So the installation procedure is is quite quite easy, um, and we've got um, what we call a circuit controller. So that replicates a lot of the um, you know like the Emerson um, multiflex boards. So um, we can set up a controller um, and then have expansion boards on that. So we've got, um, you know, might be five cases and one liquid line valve. Um, uh, that's going back to the older synthetic stuff. But. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with this, with RDM2, if you lost your main pack controller, would the other controllers are still standalone? They'll still run your system in emergency? Yes, that's or? right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so and it's all you, standalone. Yeah. And you said CAT5, CAT6, so you can use either or. That's your connection into the controllers that you'd be pulling out to, say, the cold room controllers, for an example. Uh, yeah, so we'd normally run a like a main main trunk of um, CAT5, CAT6 down to the shop floor mm -hmm. or into the main area, and then it can branch off from there through a, you know, a standard network switch. Um, you know, if you have got an island lineup, um, which you can't get a cable to, well, you just use a wireless wireless bridge, okay. you know, and you can set those up. You can buy those quite cheap. Um, and that's a that's a reliable reliable setup. Yeah. 
Can Sorry. you? I'm assuming too. You can log into these through maybe your mobile device, or um, if they're set up, you can dial in from home. Because that's one of the things that I really liked when I was a technician before I went to a on call two o'clock in the morning was to dial into the store to see what's going on. You guys have that, I guess. Uh, yes, yeah. Remote access has, um, I think, like everywhere in the world, you know, it has become a big thing. Um, you know, just that technology, you know, I mean, you've got your fingertips in your hand nowadays, don't you? You know, your phone, it does everything. Um, and being able to remotely log in, um, look at graphs, no matter where you are, check alarms, accept alarms. Um, yeah, being able to do that review hours is a real, real benefit. Um, you know, there's been lots of lots of times where I've been over the other side of the world and someone has called me and they've got an issue um, and I can log in through my phone or if I've got my laptop or iPad, um, I can connect through that, um, get into the, you know, into the nuts and bolts of the system and, and have a look and, and help them out. Um, so there's no, I mean, it depends on the on the internet, you know, um, person in charge of the internet in the building on yeah. what sort of access they give you. Um, but over here we um, we've got our own sort of three G system set up, so um, we're in control of that. It's pretty it's pretty secure. Um, it's just straight in. Yeah, and I see that more happening more here because a lot of big corporations do not want people to be able to log into their system so you use a separate router so it has nothing to do it doesn't even connect to their their main um intranet or whatever right so there's it's totally yep. separate which is more secure um so we are changing into more of a controls world refrigeration that's just hands down what it what it is especially when we're talking about co2 what are some of the challenges you've seen with engineers or technicians out there maybe either starting with RDM for the first time or even any control set or even a few years in, what are some of the challenges that you've seen? Because I'm sure you supported many engineers and technicians out there over the years and you were, you did it yourself. Um, yeah, so some of the challenges that you're seeing right now. Um, I think um, uh, generally a lot of people, you know, are prepared to, you know, they're moving with the times. And as you say, you know, we are becoming a very, it's a very technological world nowadays um and i look at you know my kids setting things up that <laughs> setting up the alexa um systems and that kind of stuff linking it to my stereo and all that kind of, kind of stuff so it is very focused around that I, I one concern i sort of do have is i i think um engineers or engineers coming through and now they don't, they just look at the data, you know, they don't quite go and check it out for themselves. So there's always been a bit of a concern is that, so if they look at the control system and they see that, well, it says the temperature's zero degrees and this is the pressure. So it has to be that, you know, it's like, okay, well, do we know that for sure? We need to verify it. If you can verify it, that it's correct, then, um, so I, I think a little bit of the, my concern is that, you know, we don't want to, yeah, it's great having all that information, but sometimes we can't just rely on all that information. We need to ascertain that what we're checking is correct. Yeah, and that's a great point. And this is what I tell, and all the trainings I do is like, you got to go verify this stuff. You can't assume. There's no assuming in refrigeration uh, because you can get caught very easy. And I did that many times over years, assuming stuff. So you do have to go check. You do have to go and make sure is that transducer reading accurately or that temperature reading accurately because um, that's very important, very important. Any uh, final words and any tips that you could give technicians who are going to either start learning more about RDM, start working on RDM, or already installing and working on that in your systems? Um, yeah, look, um, uh, we've got all our information on our, our website. All the user documents and everything but yeah reach out um if you've got any questions or any issues um reach out we've got um we've got an office in um in america um uh glasgow um malaysia 
Um, there's an, uh, me and um, there's an affiliate in New Zealand, um, and there's also RDM Australia, who's uh, another affiliate as well. So we've got between us all, we've got the world sort of covered. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, but yeah, reach out to anyone and yeah, happy to help in any way. Awesome. So that would be uh, www.resourcedm.com? Yes, that's right. Awesome. Yep. And how can people connect with you uh, if they want to reach out to you and learn more about you? Because I see a few people from New Zealand even on here. Oh, um, yeah, so I'm on uh, LinkedIn, James Darby on LinkedIn, um, um, or via email. Um, so my email is uh, james.d at resourcedm.co.nz. Awesome. James, thank you so much. Like I got a whole page of notes here. I got a lot more to learn though, to be honest with you, a lot more to learn. Like I said, I'm, I'm new to resource data management, so I'm going to learn a lot more and we'll dive in uh, more on the CO2 side next time. James, I want to thank you so yep. much for taking the time to hang out uh, here with all of us on uh, CO2 Mondays and i um, excited to see everyone next week at the next CO2 Mondays. Thank you so much, James. Great. Thank you, Trevor. See ya. See ya. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.